to begin a word of welcome to everyone who is here. A number of us have been together for these three days of the sacred trit triduum, and uh, it's always great to see the benches get a little longer at Easter time because everyone comes back home, and it's great to see some of our college students here for the weekend and maybe the longer holiday, and certainly uh, all of the family and friends of our soon-to-be initiated into the church. I know over the last few days I've spoken with a few people from all different parts of the country, and so uh, grateful that you've chosen to join us here at St. Gregory's as we give honor and praise to God and once again celebrate the, the resurrection. Tonight we really come to the culmination of our Lenten journey. We come to the culmination also of the sacred Triduum. The Easter Vigil is arguably the greatest Eucharistic liturgy in the church's calendar. Now that we're here at Easter, simple question, what were your expectations entering into Lent? What were those expectations? that you had perhaps of yourself and perhaps of God for Lent? What are the expectations of yourself and your re relationship with the Lord besides uh, and beyond this Easter celebration and through the course of your life? Over these days, we've reflected on many things. On Holy Thursday, of course, we reflected on the institution of the Eucharist, and we reflected how our celebration of the body and blood of Christ really is very similar and rooted in the understanding of the Jewish people from the time of Passover. That remembrance that we do in the name of Jesus at his command is very much like the Jewish people of Passover. That they are not just historically remembering or reenacting something, but they believe the Lord is saving them right then and there. And so we reflected our understanding of the real presence of the Lord in the Eucharist rooted in that tradition. When Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, we are, if you will, in that upper room. We are completely united with him. We are living with him and he living with us in the Eucharist. We talked about the institution of the, the priesthood, the ordained priesthood really to stand in the person of Christ and persona Christi and to serve the ministerial, sorry, as ministerial priest to serve the baptismal priesthood, that we are to be people of service as a whole. If we share that priesthood of baptism, priest, prophet, and king, and particularly the ordained ministerial, the uh, in persona Christi, standing in the person of Christ, priesthood, we're called to that service. Yesterday, Good Friday, of course, we reflected on all of those many individuals we saw as we read the Passion narrative. And uh, certainly I encourage you to think what stood out to you, who stood out to you, what words stood out to you to enter into that narrative, to place yourself there and to see what is going on in through the eyes of the individuals present therein. After these three days of our Triduum and uh, three years for the apostles as they mark the crucifixion and resurrection, three years the apostles were one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. I am sure they had many expectations. What expectations do you think they had prior to Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, being hailed as king. What expectations did they have of him prior? And certainly at that jubilant moment, what expectations do you think they had? What expe expectations do you think they had in the Garden of Gethsemane, those who were there as our Lord went to pray? And what expectations do you think the apostles had and all of the disciples the morning of the resurrection? What expectations did they have? In a larger picture, 
of all of salvation history and all of the covenants, what expectations have the covenant people had over the centuries of their relationship with God? As we heard, certainly just a small portion of that uh, salvation history in the readings this night, what expectations do the beloved Israelites have? I suppose the expectation that we have of ourselves and of God is that we deem the impossible to become possible. It's probably the expectation. Something that we expect of God and probably expect of ourselves, we deem that we want the impossible to become possible. On a personal level, we expect God in Lent to eliminate all of our bad habits, selfishness, anger, addiction, self-centeredness, and and more. We expect the Lord to do that for us. And on a global level, certainly maybe we expect uh, the good Lord to establish peace, hmm? to uh, have an end of violence, to have an end of the many wars going on and the mass shootings that we hear about all too often. These are many of the expectations we place upon the Lord. And Easter is really the reminder that what we are celebrating in the Lord, that the impossible is made possible. And we remember that God and God alone makes what appears to be impossible truly possible. That's what we celebrate with Easter. No matter how challenging things are in life, God can make the impossible possible. Our readings tonight really remind us that with God all things are possible. Our readings tonight clearly tell us that for every generation, God brings what? Hope. For every generation. We heard that in the first reading from the book of Genesis, and we know the larger story of creation and Adam and Eve. God brings order to the chaos. God orders the days and creates life. God infuses the world with life and with beauty. God made the impossible possible. He gave hope, order out of chaos. Perhaps we look to the Lord for that ourselves and the chaos of our individual lives for him to make order. And the beautiful sung version of the reading of of the Exodus, you know, God works through Moses to what? Set his people free. He parts the Red Sea. The Israelites pass through on dry land. And of course, we know the chariots and charioteers when the waters roll back are drowned. God sets his people free. What was impossible, freedom, became possible in God. God gives hope to that suffering group of his beloved Jewish people. And of course, in Ezekiel, in the reading we heard, the third one, God tells his people that they will be rescued from being in exile. After recounting Israel's unfaithfulness and the Mosaic covenant, Ezekiel prophesies that a day is coming when God will sprinkle clean water upon his people and he'll place a new spirit within them. That which seems impossible again becomes possible. And hope is given to the people through the prophet and the word of God. And then the gospel may be a simple question. What expectation do you think the women who went to the tomb had? What were their expectations? I suppose... They expected to find a dead body because they were wondering who will pull away the stone. We're going to anoint the Lord. But God makes the impossible possible. And God the Father, hope himself, what do these women do? They find the stone rolled away. And they meet this unnamed young man sitting in a white garment. What is the women's response to realizing that their expectations were not accurate. There was no dead body. But what they learned 
that Jesus had been raised. They were amazed. That was their reaction. We hear it very clearly. They're amazed. They found out that God, the Father, who makes the impossible possible, God who is hope himself, has raised his son, Jesus, our Savior. And exactly who is this young man in the white robe? Now, a lot of scripture scholars have spelled a lot of ink on this one. Who is this unnamed young man in the white robe? Well, some scripture scholars think that he represents the person of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead. Some others believe that he symbolizes all of the baptized Christians, that we must go out and proclaim Jesus Christ, the good news to all the world. And this young man really sums up the gospel of Mark, which begins, in the beginning, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And now it's the Christian community that must go out and profess and live in word and in action that good news. What is the message to the women? What did this unnamed young man tell them? Go and tell his disciples and Peter, go to Galilee and there you will see me. Go and profess the gospel. Well, tonight, we welcome new brothers and sisters to the faith. An awesome night. And uh, on Holy Thursday night, if you were here, you may recall that I mentioned a, a study from Pew Research from February of this year that stated that 80% of American adults said that religion and religion's influence is in decline in the United States. 80% of those surveyed said that religion and religious thought, religious influence is declining in their life. I also mentioned a Gallup survey that reported that only 47% of Americans are, quote, very satisfied with their life. Not joyful, not extremely satisfied, but very satisfied. And that same study done in 2003 said it was 50% who were very satisfied. 3% difference, even under the new math. And uh, in 2020, when the same study was done, 65% of Americans said they were very satisfied. We can see the sharp decline, 65% to 50% to 47% declined in saying that they are satisfied with their lives. I also mentioned on Holy Thursday night that in the United States, we saw in the news that uh, we fell off the top 20 list of the happiest places to live in the world. We're now number 23. And they particularly cited in that study that it was the people 30 years of age and younger who are dissatisfied with their life and dissatisfied and not happy. In the midst of all of that, I will baptize eight adults tonight. Eight adults who are on fire with the Lord. In addition to that, we will welcome four brothers and sisters who were previously baptized in other Christian faiths who desire to live their faith with us in the Catholic Church. In addition to that, there'll be four more who will receive their first Holy Communion. This is apart from the children who will receive First Communion in May. In addition to that, there are 10 adults among us who were catechized as adults and desire to receive the Sacrament of Confirmation. Even under the new math, that's 26 people. And in the midst of all of those statistics I gave you, and uh, within that culture where 80% are saying religion really has little meaning and a declining meaning, no longer influential, we, we welcome 26 to our church here at St. Greg's, to the Catholic Church throughout the world here. God makes 
in this place and time what might seem impossible, possible. God really is hope. And my dear brothers and sisters who I will have the privilege to baptize and confirm, to receive into the church, to give communion to for the first time, you need to know that as a parish family and as a church, we, we love you. You know that we support you. We need you. And uh, we thank you that in a difficult moment in the chapter of history, you come forward because God who accomplishes all things can seem to do what is impossible and make it possible. God has given you that gift of hope. And we know that you really become that gift of hope for all of us as you come to the sacraments today. Maybe this Lent and this Easter really has not been about our expectations, but maybe it's really a call for us in a greater way to embrace God's expectations for us. And those expectations to be just like the women who went to the tomb to go out to call others to that discipleship to meet the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. We do this in a world that desperately needs it. For a soon-to-be-initiated and for all of us, God is calling us to serve him. And I know at this point in the homily, a few of you are wondering one thing. When is he going to bring up the peeps? Right? So. Don't be disappointed. <laughs> For those who are not regularly with us since 2018, we've talked about peeps. Now, I'm not going to go through them all, you know, because there's too many. I did bring the standard, you know, traditional yellow peeps, you know. I think this represents St. Gregory's, you know. And we have the blue peeps. That represents St. St. Pius X, and uh, I did bring the, the pink peeps, Good Shepherd, you know, three parishes in the family of parishes. I was bequeathed uh, the newest of all peeps, Party Cake peeps. You know, they, I think it was an incentive to make sure I did it. But two of them that I found on my own, and with this I conclude, what gift do our new, to soon to be, baptized, confirmed, fully initiated, welcome to the church received today, and all of us who are already baptized, what do we receive? We receive really a treasure chest of grace from God. We'll never untap all that treasure chest. And lucky for me, peeps came out with a treasure chest this year. <laughs> they did. And it's called the mystery treasure chest because our life in Christ is still a mystery. As much as we understand, we must still come to a deeper understanding, unfold the mystery, the expectations that the Lord has for each one of us. And something that's very important for us all is to remember that God truly delights in you. We hear that in the scripture, we sing it in the Psalms, the Lord takes delight in his people. And it's very important because so often we focus maybe where we fall short or where we sin, where we don't seem to measure up. And of course, we must work on those areas, no question. But never discount the fact that God takes delight in you. And lucky for us, this year, Peeps came out with a pa package called Delights. <laughs> and they're peeps that are dipped in chocolate. <laughs> which when I open these, I know I will delight in as well. <laughs> this Easter, know that we're all called to unpack that mystery in a deeper way. And never, ever forget that the expectation of the Lord, in part, is for you to realize how much he delights in you. And he finds you worthy to serve him in the world 
today. This time I invite Dr. Peer to come forward. I invite you to remain seated as Dr. Peer